Is your job search stuck? Maybe you're not getting any interviews with employers, or maybe you are, but no job offers. Or you may be new and not even know where to start. This is Charles Maxwood, and I'm releasing a new course and ebook on how to find a job as a software developer. The course walks you through the process of finding the types of companies you want to work for, getting their attention, and putting your best foot forward as the candidate they want. I've coached dozens of developers in looking for jobs and have been able to help several people find jobs within two weeks, two months. So whether you're new to development, can't find a great job that fits what you want, or are looking for remote work from an area without a strong tech community, I can help. Go to getacoderjob.com and sign up today. Hey everybody, and welcome to another My JavaScript Story. Our special guest today is Rob Eisenberg. Rob, do you want to say hi? Hey, everyone. Now, I'm trying to remember all the episodes we've had you on. We've definitely had you on Adventures in Angular. Yep. And I think on JavaScript Jabber as well, although it's been a little while. Yeah, we we had you on episode 80. We talked about Aurelia Mm -hmm. on Adventures in Angular. And also on episode 9 of Adventures in Angular, we talked about Angular 2. Mm Mm-hmm back when people were uh, worried about <laughs> Angular 2 because they posted all those headstones at, what was it, uh, yes. or, uh, NG Europe or something? Yeah. Yes, I remember. I remember well. Uh, the good old days. Yeah, we've also had you on episode 203 of JavaScript Jabber talking about Aurelia. So. Cool. Yeah, I can't, it's, <laughs> it's been over a period of like four years, those uh-huh. podcasts that you're talking about. So I've... I've forgotten half half of it myself. Unfortunately, yeah. I'm getting older and my brain isn't working <laughs> in that way anymore. It's been a few years. I mean, both of those episodes, Adventures in Angular and JavaScript Jabber were in 2016. Mm-hmm. Is there anything else that you've done that you want to just mention briefly that people might know you for before we jump in and start talking about your journey into programming? I think maybe we'll probably cover, mostly I'm I'm kind of known for different open source work that I've done over the years and maybe we'll kind of hit on, hit on my progression through that world as we talk about my larger journey. Mm-hmm. Yep, definitely. Well, let's, let's go all the way back to the beginning of your journey then. How did you get into programming? Yeah. So, uh, when I was about eight years old or so, my father, uh, wanted to buy a, uh, a personal computer. And so I, I remember going down to Sears with him at the time and buying the first couple of components of our Commodore 64. So, um, for those that remember back then there were, there were, you would buy the, you know, the, the disc drive and then you'd buy the, what effectively the CPU, which was the, the keyboard looking unit. Those uh-huh. were different different pieces you would buy and you could optionally buy a monitor. Uh, at the time we didn't have the money for that. So we had like this extra small black and white TV, right? And that was our, <laughs> it was our first monitor. I remember going back down later with him when we had got the money to, to get like the, the dot matrix color printer and the, and, uh, and uh, you know, the 16 color monitor. But uh, that's where my fascination with computers started. And back then the place in the house that we had to even set the thing up was was my bedroom. And so we we set it up in there and uh, I'd play some games and I just got fascinated by this notion that you could somehow write, you know, type text in, into a thing and make it do do stuff. And back then I didn't know anyone that programmed, I didn't, you know, this was in, this was the mid eighties. And so my, my father had a friend at work that got one of the early coding magazines. And when his buddy was done reading them, he would give them my dad, he'd bring them home to me and I would, you know, copy the code out of those magazines, (laughs) you know, line by line into, into, into the Commodore that, you know, that blue background and typing out the line numbers. And that was Commodore basic. And eventually I saved up my own money and I bought my first Commodore basic programming book and it was magical for me. I I don't know how to explain it. There's some way in which I feel that my entire career as an adult software engineer has been trying to find my way back to that magical (laughs) early world of, of kind of discovering programming. It was, it was a lot of fun. I don't think people would really stand for it today. It was, it's so tedious in, in retrospect, but it, but as a kid, it was so, fun to just type this stuff in and and see what it would do and it was it was just amazing creative outlet and so uh, that's how i first started and at some point we got a um 
a 286 with DOS on it. And, and I started learning about QBasic and QuickBasic. And so I, I moved along to doing that kind of stuff, which was pretty easy transition. It's just other flavors of basic. And then I heard about this language called C and it was the ultimate, you know. Oh yeah. You can do anything with C. And I remember going down to the public library uh, because again, it's the, you know, there, there was no internet, right? And there was uh-huh. no massive programming sections of bookstores, right? So I remember going down to the public library and there were a total of three books, you know, on C programming. And I checked every one of them out repeatedly and read them repeatedly. And and here's the really funny thing. This people will probably get a kick out of this. Just because still I had no connections. I didn't, you know, I didn't know anyone that did this stuff. I didn't have a compiler. <laughs> <laughs> oh really? For my C program. So when I first started to learn C, I eventually solved this problem. Uh, I saved up my own money and and I ended up buying Borland compiler, like a student license. But there was this period between there where I didn't have a compiler, and I, I literally learned to program by writing my programs on notebook paper. Like I would read the books, oh, wow. and then I would write them and it's it seems so crazy yeah, uh, today but, today, but yeah. as a but as a kid this is uh, like what I first started doing like I would kind of design out my programs and and write write code I still I actually saved some of this stuff oh wow so I have I have it like lying around and in, in one place I have some of my early like handwritten out programs and I was really big into adventure games and things like that and so Eventually, I started writing my own little adventure game engine, and I, I still have the. Um, that was in C plus plus when I moved on to C plus plus, and I uh, and I had a compiler and everything, and I I still have the printout of all my source code, back when we used to print out our source code. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it's so crazy to talk about it now, right? But back at the time. It was just the way me as a kid, again, not really knowing. You know, eventually when I got into junior high school, there was like one other kid that I knew that was into this stuff, you know, and we'd geek out on it. But, you know, uh-huh. I, I still didn't really know anyone that their job was I write software, right? So there, there was there was nowhere to go. And there was, again, still no internet, right? So, but it was a ton of fun. I mean, I, I spent so much time just trying to, to figure out stuff probably stuff i wouldn't have patience to figure out anymore but back then it was it was a lot of fun and and then i you know i i kind of it was just really intense hobby of mine through high school and then when i when i got uh, to the end of high school i kind of had to pick which path i was going to go i had a couple of loves one of them was computers and and computer programming the other one was music i had uh-huh. started playing started playing drums actually i was a percussionist and i started when i was in junior high and i i uh, and then i started in high school i started composing music uh, so i was uh, composing for piano and and some small orchestral music actually and things like that and i i had these two big loves and it was a kind of a crisis of do I go to one university and study music or do I go to another one and study computer science? Right. Uh, and I'm sure people will think this very strange, but I literally asked God, what do I do? And I came to this conclusion to study music. And at the time it was very, my family always supported me in what I did, but uh, it was a very kind of odd decision, not, not very practical. On this side of it uh, though, it was absolutely the best decision that I ever made because uh, I studied music composition, and a lot of what I worked through in composing music and in music theory, I think gave me has given me a very unique perspective on software design. When you're writing large scale orchestral pieces, you're uh, composing for dozens of instruments that all have to play at once to form some unified thing. And every uh-huh. every piece, every note, every every pitch, every rhythm, it all has to work together. Each thing is an individual thing, but it all combines to one thing. And everything in modern composition of music has to be justified, right? Why, why, why this note? Why that rhythm? So there's a very, there's a very academic and rigorous aspect of it, but there's also an artistic aspect of it. And of course, the human, in the end, humans experience this music. Right. Um, and so I think there's a lot of parallels to how humans experience software. And then how those how that software is kind of put together uh, out of so many pieces that that form a unified whole and the way that you mm-hmm. kind of conceive of that 
process of constructing something like that. And, uh, and so I, I ended up studying music composition and music theory at university. And I kind of stepped away from programming for a little bit, although I did, they had a, um, I was at Florida State and they had a, like a computer a music tech program, like a certificate program that I did kind of on the side, but it was super lightweight. I took like one, one C programming class that I mostly didn't attend because I <laughs> I'd, I'd been there and done that already. Right. Um, but I, I, um, so I went through this process of, of actually did a two degrees in music, two bachelor's degrees, uh, one in one composition, one in theory. And then I started my master's work in composition and Along that point in time, I became kind of disillusioned with uh, academia, in particular in music. And I started looking back at computers and I thought, how can I use these things together? And uh, a buddy of mine and I put together a video game music company and we went to oh, GDC wow. and we were composing music and trying to break into the to the game industry that we totally failed at actually breaking in uh, to the game industry, but it rekindled my passion for programming. I started again, like picking up some books on audio programming and uh, DirectX audio programming and all kinds of things like this. And that kind of stepped me back towards programming again. At the time I was, uh, my career was basically, I was a music teacher. You know, I, I, I taught private music lessons and I taught uh, at some of the high schools I taught, uh, drum line and, and different things like this. I had some still close connections with the university and a lot of the schools in the area that I was living. And I was trying to spin up this music thing on the side for video games and that didn't work out, but I, I got back into programming and one of my close friends said, hey, have you taken a look at this language called C Sharp? And I said, ah, I don't know. I mean, how can it get any better than C++? I mean, <laughs> right? C++ is, you know, I can, I can do anything I want. You know, it's object oriented. I, I was, I, I am and have always been just uh, fascinated with, with object oriented design and, 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 and the concepts and structures and object oriented programming. But one day I, I literally was in a book, you know, in a bookstore. Now the bookstore is having actual, you know, large computer programming sections. But by, by that point in time, this was around 2003, I picked up this book on um it was like teach yourself c sharp in 24 hours like one of those kind of books and i was like mm -hmm. ah, it was on sale and it came with like the cd and everything i was like what the heck and i took it home and i was enthralled by how i had not worked in managed programming languages before right so i had i mean basic i suppose is is its own thing but uh, most of my time had then been spent in c and c++ so when i looked at c sharp and was building, I was building some Windows applications at first, and I was comparing that back to like Borland's OWL and the Win32 APIs and all those things. It was just such a different world and how it had changed in just a, a few years while I, while I had uh, kind of been through college and whatnot. And I just fell back in love with it again and started making stuff. And I, same friend that had got me into that said, well, I've got this opportunity you know, we've, I'm working in this research and development wing of this small company and we're rebuilding this product. And um, it's an ASP.NET web app. This was .NET 1.1. 1 .1. And, mm -hmm. uh, and he said, we don't have a ton of money. You know, they could probably only pay you like part time. We're basically working out of this bed, you know, the spare bedroom in this guy's house. Right. But I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. let's do it. You know? And um yeah, worked on worked on that project for about two years. And the fun thing about about that is that was actually the first time I started doing web programming was was on that because I paid very little attention to HTML in kind of like in the late 90s um, uh -huh. when I was when I was finishing up high school. I, I graduated high school in, in 98. So you are so old. So uh, I graduated in 98 as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I paid no mind to HTML at the time because like, ah, this can't do what I want, you know, I uh, right. You know, and and so in the early 2000s, 2000, this is 2004, we were building this this crazy web app with that was fully skinnable, that it was totally modular, that the end user could plug in different modules. And it was basically like a CMS mixed with, I don't know, if it had workflows, all kinds of stuff. And we built just so much crazy tech as part of this during mm -hmm. between 2004 and 2006. Um, we actually built our own scripting language. We built an XML-based declarative UI language, 
with data oh, wow. binding. And so the, the solution had like workflows you could define at runtime that would then put these dynamic forms in front of people that were written with this XML based markup language that had data bindings against the dynamic model and all this kind of uh -huh. stuff. And as part of this, I had to build the design tools for the people that would configure this app um, for their end users. And this was before the term Ajax was even coined. Back then, the circles I was in, the circles I was in, I guess we called it a silent postback. So I built this Ajax based front end tech for doing WYSIWYG design of all this stuff. Huh. And that's really when I started to see the power of what could be done in, in a browser client side. Um, right. That would that would have been like, that was, yeah, that was 2004, 2005. And so very different world still from today in terms of JavaScript. But um, if you worked like crazy to deal with the weird things in browsers, you could you could make some pretty amazing stuff happen even back then. Yeah, I'm, I'm um, curious, you know, as you made this transition, you know, you were you got into .NET, C Sharp. Uh, I'm curious, you start making this transition to web. What was it about web that finally roped you in? Because, yeah, when I was playing with HTML in high school, it was like, yeah, this is fun. This is a toy. This isn't, you know, I'm not going to do anything right. serious with this. And yeah, it sounds like by, you know, 2004, 2005, you were fully bought in. So what well, changed? I'm not sure if I was fully bought in, but I started to kind of realize the power at that point in time. However, what was also happening at that point in time is Microsoft was working on Windows Presentation Foundation, which was this XML declarative based vector graphics hardware accelerated UI framework, you know. So I was also kind of falling in love with that simultaneously just because of the crazy things you could do graphically with it and how easy it was to do some of these things. And it, and it had data binding. And so there was some cross-pollination between that and the work we were doing on the web. But I really ended up getting into WPF, my business, who became my business partner. He and I wrote one of the first books on it. And and actually, I that's when I actually started writing the first front-end framework that I had ever done. So I've kind of been in this space of front-end framework development since 2004, 2005. 2005, I wrote, started working on something called Caliburn, which was this front-end framework for Windows Presentation Foundation, because oh, wow. it was, it was, um, it was, uh, you know, WPF was, had this amazing graphics capabilities, and but it turned out when you went to build real applications with it, there was tons of boilerplate. People often ended up building things that were impossible to unit test. There were just a lot of practical challenges in building a real app, and so I, I built a framework basically that was inspired by Ruby on Rails mm -hmm. for building Windows desktop applications. Oh, interesting. That, yeah, that would let you build, build things with these pure view models that we used. This was kind of, again, around when people first started talking about the MVVM pattern, model view, view model. Um, that was around 2005. And so I, I built a framework around these ideas and, and shipped a bunch of software and then Silverlight came along and, and that was, so these are the things that like distracted me from the web basically is what I'm getting at. So right. Silverlight, Silverlight kind of came along and that was like WPF, but in the browser. And there was a big promise around that, which ended up not, you know, coming to light. And so when, yeah. when, when Silverlight died, I said, you know, forget this native, you know, platform specific stuff. And I, that's at the point when I really, really invested in the web. I, I came kind of back to JavaScript for a second time and said, I'm going to really dig deep and learn this language with the same intensity that I had learned C++ or, or C Sharp. And I'm going to try and take you know, what I'd learned on the desktop, building front end stuff on the desktop and see like, did it make sense for any of this to live in the browser? Because I knew the same problems essentially in application development were gonna be there. So it was, it was kind of a matter of, well, what does that look like on the web? You know, right. how does that translate? And then I, I started working on something called Durandal. And that was uh, roughly like in the same time that Angular JS was, coming on the scene as well. So 2009, 2010, actually, I actually started on it in 2008, but I don't, I didn't, it was for my own personal project, uh, a business thing that I was doing on the side. I think it was 2009, 2010 when I first talked publicly about that, 
Uh, and that's when the the JavaScript frameworks were really first starting to to come on the scene. Ember was around, AngularJS was around, yeah, uh, and Durandal came around. Um, those weren't the first frameworks. There were stuff like Sprout Core and whatnot before that. But they start they started around that time frame to kind of become known, become a thing. Those are the right. the early days of that. And yeah, I, I my career is kind of been centered around this open source work that started back in 2005 with this Caliber and WPF framework and the evolution of those ideas onto the web and mm -hmm. through various frameworks. And so I worked on Durandal. And then when I was preparing to kind of do the V next to that, I ended up getting connect with, connected with the Angular team. And that's when I worked with them for about 10 months on Angular 2 and plus, I, I guess I, I'll say. Uh -huh. Yeah, I remember you were doing some work on the router and things like that. Yep. With them, you were on the core team. Yeah, a lot of the work I did on that router for Angular came from the the router from Durandal, which was inspired by a bunch of things that we called screen activation patterns, which came from Caliburn going back to 2005. So there was this transgression, a uh, transgression. <laughs> Maybe it was a transgression. There was a, a trans <laughs> there was a uh, there was this transition over the years of how these ideas had evolved, just kind of looking at how people build mm -hmm. screens and switch between screens and how users move through apps and all the conditions around that. And it started, yeah, it started way back in, in Caliburn with, with these patterns we called screen activation patterns. And we had a bunch of names for them, uh, for different different you know kinds of combinations and transactional screen things that would happen. And that just kind of carried forward, forward and transformed into what you see, actually, if you look at almost any router today, you'll see a lot of uh, these kinds of patterns now in, in those routers. So I think it was it was kind of cool being part of the Angular team at that time because I was able to kind of bring some of those ideas into that group. And then that kind of also fed other people with new ideas as well. Right. Uh, and uh, yeah, and, and then Aurelia came after that, which was me kind of returning to Durandal more or less and kind of rebranding it and and picking up where I'd left off. And, um, and that's where I've kind of been in the open source space for the last four years. And right now we're working kind of on our V next of that. And uh, it, so that's, and that's, those are the kind of the, the ways that people would know me is just through that the progression of open source front end framework work over the years and did a lot of consulting around front end. And, and now I work, I work at Envision as a principal engineer on Envision Studio uh, doing a lot of, kind of architectural work around the front end of that app. Mm -hmm. So I just adore, I'm not a designer, right? But I right. absolutely adore UI and UX and and bringing that to life and how to make that easy for engineers, how to enable people to write clean code and testable code and maintainable code in the context of these complex uh, and increasingly complex user interfaces and support all kinds of interactions. That makes sense. I'm, I'm a little curious. I remember you were on the Angular core team and then, yeah, like you said, you left and you started working on Aurelia. What, what was that transition like? Into Aurelia or? Yeah, especially yeah. from Durandal where it kind of already had somewhat of a following and you rebranded it. And just... Yeah, a lot of the people from Durandal came along into, into Aurelia because it, it was very much in the same line of thinking. In fact, there are people using Aurelia today that used Calibrin back in the day. So oh, wow. there, there's this community of people that I pulled along through this progression with me over the years who just kind of agreed with me around particular values and principles in the framework and methodology for designing software where these frameworks really resonated with them and, and helped them build things in the way that they wanted to build them. And so they saw, and a number of these people, what they saw in Caliburn or in Durandal, they also saw in Aurelia. And so they just, it was very natural for them to kind of come along for the ride, so to speak. There's a lot of, there was a lot of community building. Um, open source, now I've been doing it for 13 years and I've had to learn a lot about how to do that <laughs> over the years, I'm a sure. lot of mistakes. I've almost burned myself out a number of times. I've almost gone bankrupt a number of times. And so it's trying to learn about how to 
run a marathon instead of a sprint? You know, what does it look like to be involved in open source over a long period of time and to continue to run that race uh, without burning out um, either physically or destroying yourself financially? The funding for open source projects is much better today than it was, you know, 10 years ago or something like that. Right. But it's still, still not where it needs to be. But I've known not just myself, but other open source developers that have worked on libraries or frameworks that were absolutely critical for many, you know, thousands and thousands of companies where the, you know, the person leading the project ended up in a financial state of disaster almost, you know? Yeah. And uh, that's, yeah, it's, it's not, a, that's not uncommon and it's a real, real challenge. So I've kind of had to, you know, thank God I'd never went bankrupt, but I got really close a few times and got, like I said, really close to, to burning completely out a few times and kind of had to learn those lessons. And then also you just learn so much about working with people and communities as well. And um, the more popular something get, uh, gets, the more variety of people will come at it. And th- mm-hmm. not everyone, not everyone's always pleasant. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, On the internet? So, I have no yeah, idea what you're talking yeah. about. <laughs> So learning to, you know, there's an aspect of kind of learning to stay true to what you believe is the vision of the framework or library that you're working Mm -hmm. on and not being pulled this way or that way from, you know, people that disagree with you. And it's fine for people to disagree, you know. Mm -hmm. I think if you look at the major kind of JavaScript frameworks today, more or less, they all can get you to the same end result. And so then it comes down to more of a question of what are the different opinions or approaches that they take and how does that mesh with your specific team, your specific product. And so it's become even more important to me over the years that we stay true to kind of our core values and vision around Aurelia because that's, you know, a few of those things are what makes it really unique and why you would pick that instead of something else maybe, you know. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's been that's I don't know that feels really long winded, but that's been my journey uh, from <laughs> Commodore sixty four to JavaScript framework, and it's been fun. It's fun to look back on it, and it's I'm really envious of of people today that want to kind of get into this space because it's just mm-hmm. so many resources on the internet. You can open up a web browser and learn and code in the browser. You know, just about anything, and uh, it's it's a it's fun and exciting time and it's very empowering i think um if you're a creative person so one other thing i want to ask is just i mean what are you working on now yeah so my day job i i work at envision and i work on a product called envision studio which is a screen design tool and it's for designers and developers that are you know like I said, it's for designing screens. So, a t- you know, any app that lives on any kind of screen, right? Whether it's a mm-hmm. phone or a watch or a TV screen or your desktop computer. So that's what I work on uh, during the day. And then at night, I work on uh, Aurelia. And we're just now, we're actually pretty deep into our VNext implementation of Aurelia. And it's been super, super exciting uh, to watch that grow. We've moved to TypeScript and we've done a lot of work to uh, make it smaller, make it faster, uh, build it in a way that's easier for the community to be involved. Really extensive uh, focus on tests. I think this, as of this week, we've got 90% test coverage now on it, and that's over 42,000 unit and integration tests. So I'm, I'm really, really excited about the work that we're doing there because I think uh, we're going to have one of the, the coolest pieces of tech and not just capable and, and, and cool, but uh, validatable and, and trustable, you know, through all the testing work that we're doing. Uh, so that's that's something I'm super excited about and uh, super excited about Envision Studio that I'm working on at, at uh, Envision where I work, um, which is just an amazing product for, like I said, for designing apps and uh, kind of fits into our, uh, this big, bigger Envision ecosystem we have too of uh, collaborating around app design. That's my plug for the company I work for. I really think mm-hmm. anyone anyone building stuff in front end should be using our tech just to collaborate and and design their software. Um, it's a transformative for how you build your front ends. Yeah, I've talked to a couple of people over there. I'm trying to remember names and I'm drawing a blank, but I'm pretty sure we've had people from Envision on the show and 
anyway, it's, it, it is, it's terrific and interesting technology. Yeah. I've, I have, uh, it's a great, great group of people too. That's, that's building it. Everyone's super passionate about the space and really uh, of a mindset to kind of transform how we all collaborate, you know, between developer and designer and, and product, how we all kind of work together to, to produce these, these experiences for our customers. Uh, so very, very fun stuff. Very cool stuff. Yeah. What, what's coming in Aurelia V next? What, what kinds of things are you working on there? Yeah. So the, it's interesting uh, with V next, we're trying to maintain as much backwards compatibility as we can. One of the characteristics of Aurelia has been uh, that it tries to get the framework out of your way so that you don't mm-hmm. see, you don't see a lot of the framework code in your app code. So it's very unobtrusive. Uh, there are simple conventions. And so one of the things we're doing with vNext is because the framework is already kind of out of your way so much, we're looking to see, can we literally keep the same templating language, the same binding language, the same conventions, the same decorators, effectively all the same high-level APIs that represent 80% of what you interact with, but change the implementation under the hood so right. that... You don't learn anything new, basically, in terms of the new templating language or binding language or whatnot. You don't have a whole lot of new stuff to learn, and your stuff can migrate very easily. But the way that it's implemented now is much more efficient, smaller, faster. Um, architectural improvements, so we've, we're, we've made the entire framework a lot more pluggable down to the compiler level. So you can plug into the compiler and extend uh, syntax and all kinds of stuff as a fully supported extensibility point. So it's just uber extensible. I mean, that was extensibility was always a big thing with Aurelia, but we've kind of, you know, taken it up to the next level here. And like I said, it's smaller, it's better performing. We've had a lot of focus on quality uh, with the testing strategies that we're putting in, in place. And w- the other thing Aurelia has always been good at is web standards. But again, we're trying to take that up to the next level. So a lot of our stuff now, if you look in our expression parsers or in our binding engine, you'll see all these references to specific parts of, you know, what WG or ECMA specifications where we've implemented things exactly uh, to match others, you know, the, the specifications. So we're really working very, very hard so that, you know, for the most part, when people learn Aurelia, the bulk of what they're learning is web standards as well. So their their knowledge and experience there transcends the, the framework. So frameworks will inevitably come and go. If you're going to be a web developer over a long, long period of time, it's been my belief is that the most important thing you can do is to invest in the standards of the web itself. And so Aurelia kind of takes that approach too, where you know, it tries to get out of your way, tries to orient itself around standards so that you learn uh, a lot of web standard stuff in the process. And so we're just kind of taking that up a notch. Um, again, unobtrusiveness, you know, conventions, these are all part of the current version of Aurelia, but in Vnext, again, we're going even further. Like, could we get the decorators out of your code? Like, could we, could we actually make conventions and extensibility point of the framework where, um, yeah, we ship with a default set of conventions for how to put things together. But if you want to, you can teach the framework your own set of app-specific conventions. This is kind of in line with the philosophy that I'm a big believer with, uh, that I heard Bob Martin kind of talk about a whole lot, which is that most frameworks are kind of built with this mentality that your application should plug into the framework. And really that's a that's putting the framework in the position of power, right? Dictating mm-hmm. how you build how you build your app. But ideally, the framework should plug itself into your app. Your app should be able to have the architecture that makes sense for it, and it should not be, uh, you know, it should control the framework, right? And and so, a lot of what we're doing with Aurelia is in that spirit of keeping the framework out of your app as much as possible, and then giving you the power to basically say here's how I want to write my app. Let me teach the framework about the way that we're writing our app and then let the framework plug into your app in that way. All these things are kind of, have kind of been core to Aurelia always, but with our VNext, we're just kind of taking them up to the next level. We're trying to push them even farther. We've always had great performance, but you know we're going to have better performance. We're going to have better size. 
we have we have a great community, but you know, what can we do to make the code base more approachable so that people it will be easier for them to get involved and to contribute? So we're doing a lot around documentation and not not just consumer documentation, if you will, for people building apps, but engineering documentation for people that actually want to dig in and work on it. Right. To understand what are the architectural decisions that were made inside the framework and why and these kind of things. So that's kind of the work we're doing with, with VNext to kind of take it to the next level of each of the each of the core things that it's I, I think that it's already good at in its present version, but how can we push those farther and bring the community along in a way that doesn't involve massive rewrites or massive having to learn new things. Right. Uh, and it's it's coming along swimmingly actually. I'm I'm super excited about it. It's not quite in an alpha phase yet, so I wouldn't want anyone to go build anything with it, but we're getting really close. Um and like I said, we've already got, you know, 90% test coverage and over 40,000 tests um representing that and um that is most of the major features of the framework in. So now we're just kind of getting the edge cases and, and polishing and making sure we've got the APIs exactly with the way we want them. Um, those kind of things, bringing online the plugins that people, you know, like router and validation mm-hmm. and internationalization and all those other kind of things that make a <clears throat> an end-to-end solution. So we're kind of bringing the those pieces in now. And I think it's it's going to be exciting. I think it's it's going to be really cool for the community. And I think a lot of people that haven't looked at Aurelia or maybe looked at it a few years ago, it's going to be time for them to kind of take a new, fresh look at that version of it, uh, because I think it's going to be it's going to be pretty darn cool. <laughs> Very cool. Well, let's get you on JavaScript Jabber to talk about it. Yeah, I'd love to. I, I think I mentioned when we were talking before the show that we're booked out for recording dates until like January. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that means that we're probably looking at like a late February release, but it sounds like that's about good timing for you. For yeah, that'd be great. I mean, I'm hopeful that if we did something around that time, people would be able to listen to the show and then go actually play with some of the new stuff. Right. So. Yeah. So we'll see if we can get that lined up and that way people who are interested in Aurelia can go see, oh, this is all new stuff. This looks great. Yeah. And just, just figure out, you know, what solutions it fills the need for. Definitely. All right. Well, uh, one last question. If people want to find you online, where do they go? I am Eisenberg Effect on Twitter and just about everywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> so they can find me there through any of the Aurelia channels. They can find me as well. Um, that's where I spend most of my my time. So, yep. Uh, one other question that I have for you is, uh, do you have a blog or a website that people can go hit? You know, my personal blog is eisenbergeffect.bluespire.com, but I don't publish there very often. Okay. Mostly I'm publishing through our the Aurelia blog, which is blog.aurelia.io. Uh, nice. We have posts there every every couple of weeks, I think. Um, not all of them by me, just by different core team members. And we have community members that we invite as well. But that's that's where I would uh, that's what I'd check out. All right, sounds good. Well, I'm going to start heading this toward wrapping up, and that means picks. Do you run your own freelance business, or maybe you're thinking about picking up some business on the side? Well, then you need FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the quickest and easiest way to get invoices out to your clients. It's easy to use. It works anywhere. Available from any device uh, on the desktop, iPhone, iPad, Android. And all of your data is backed up and secure. And it makes it really easy to get organized and get paid. You'll be tracking time, logging expenses, and invoicing your clients in no time. You can also save time billing, freeing up several days per month to focus on the work that you love, and you get paid faster. FreshBooks customers are paid on average five days faster because there's a link on the invoice that says pay me now. And it's a great way to grow your business. Plus, FreshBooks is offering a 30-day trial. That's right, 30-day trial if you try them out. So go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Once again, for a 30-day trial, go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. You have some things you want to shout out about on the show? Sure. I've really been getting into uh, decentralized apps or dApps. I'm not sure if you've had anyone on the show talking about that kind of stuff, but this is all the tech related to uh, you know, building apps on the blockchain and mm-hmm. PFS. And so my first pick is 
a, a little database called OrbitDB, which is uh, a database built on top of IPFS for building dApps with. Uh, and it uses uh, CRDTs, which are, I, I'm not sure, again, how familiar people are uh, with those, but it just uh, allows effectively synchronizing various versions of data across multiple clients correctly and consistently. And it's, it's really, really cool research happening in the space. So check out OrbitDB if you are um, interested in DAP development. And I will, so that's my technical pick. And I've got a couple more that are fun. I've got uh, two, two young boys and uh, we like to play board games and card games and, and, and I love role playing games. There's a fun independent game called Robit Riddle which is a, if you can imagine, a choose-your-own-adventure book in a board game mm -hmm. uh, where you collaboratively kind of tell the story and go up against challenges, and the, it comes with little storybooks that you read through, and uh, the kids can kind of do some basic role-playing and storytelling, and it's a, lot of, it's a lot of fun. So if you have kids, the kids are, my kids are pretty imaginative and like to tell stories anyways. It's a fun it's a fun thing to do together with them. And the second one, which is kind of along the lines of kids stuff, uh, is a series of books called The Wingfeather Saga, um, which is a fantasy series uh, kind of aimed towards, you know, I'd say, ages six to 12. Um, I read it to my kids and we had a lot of, a lot of fun, really well written. It's multiple, you know, multiple novels, uh, everything kind of very well timed together and very well told mm -hmm. um, and a lot of really good teachable moments uh, if you will for parents throughout the books things to talk about and uh, as the main characters are kids and go through kind of each of their individual struggles through the through the adventure um, so those are my picks orbit db robot riddle and the wing feather saga nice yeah i have a couple of uh, role play game type things that I bought. I used to play Dungeons and Dragons with Joe Eames, who's uh, organizer of NGConf and he's on mm -hmm. JavaScript Jabber and Views on View and Adventures in Angular. And uh, a couple of those, I'm just going to shout them out. Um, I've read the book for the one. I haven't read through the book for the other because I just got it, but it's the same kind of thing as kind of a Dungeons and Dragons simplified for kids. And so you get a character sheet and then you make them go through an adventure. Uh, mm -hmm. The one is called Little Wizards. And mm -hmm. uh, I've been looking forward to playing that with my kids. I'm not sure what ages your kids are, but my oldest is 12. He's almost 13, and my youngest is two. Um, so you got a big gap are, there. <laughs> yeah, there's a gap between my youngest and second youngest. So my next youngest is seven. Gotcha. Um, so and I have, mine are uh, eight and nine, basically. Yeah. So I have a 12 year old, an 11 year old, a nine year old, and a seven year old that would all play these games. And uh, looking forward to that. But yeah, I just, I've been super busy. I haven't taken the time <laughs> to do it. But yeah. So uh, it's it's fun. It takes place on coin world is what they call the world. And yeah, it's it, it seems like a really just fun way to go. And yeah, the thing that I like is, again, like you said, it gives the kids a chance to tell a story and, you know, kind of explore, you know, how people can interact. And mm -hmm. yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm excited to do that. Um, incidentally, my wife and I um, planned a trip next week. So uh, my kids have fall break. And we're going up to Park City, Utah, uh, which is where the Olympic training uh, area is. It's also where the Sundance Film Festival is held. But yeah, we're just going to go up there for a week. And so we'll probably, uh, well, not quite a week. We're going up Wednesday night after they get out of school and we're coming back Monday night. Um, so, yeah, that'll be fun. And uh, we just booked a condo on VRBO. Mm -hmm. um, and it's funny because Airbnb has been hit or miss for me. Mm -hmm. But VRBO has been ultra consistent. And so I've been really happy with that. I got a VRBO also when I went up for a framework summit, which was also in park city and yeah, I got into a really nice place for not a lot of money. I was like 10 minutes from the, the conference and yeah, just really had a terrific time. And so I'm also going to pick park city. So if you ever come out to Utah, uh, Salt Lake city's got a bunch of stuff to do downtown, which is fun. Uh, you know, Temple Square and some of the other stuff downtown is definitely worth seeing. But Park City is just beautiful. And it's cool. kind of all spread out across uh, a couple of different areas. 
and all of those different areas have something different to offer. If you come up in the winter and you're a big skier, a lot of those areas, they either offer shuttles to the ski lifts or some of them, they feel like they're right in town, but they're literally walking distance to ski lifts. So hmm. anyway, cool. but yeah, so lots of fun stuff. Thanks for coming, Rob. Hey, it's my pleasure. I'm glad we finally were able to connect. Yep. Yeah, things have been a little bit nuts, but uh, yeah, we'll get back to it. And uh, yeah, we will catch everybody next week. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.